Section number 18 of The Empire of Business by Andrew Carnegie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kat Din in Osaka, Japan. The Empire of Business, Section 18, Variety versus Uniformity. Variety versus Uniformity. The socialist needs to revolutionize human nature before he can even test his theories, for nature abhors a vacuum not more than she does uniformity. No two blades of grass are alike, and the higher we go in creation, the greater the variations. No two fishes, no two animals are alike. Huber tells us he was able to distinguish the individual ants in the hill, so different was one from another. When humanity is considered, no two children but display wide differences the more intelligent being the more individualistic. No two families are alike, and we're all placed under similar conditions. Houses and grounds alike, incomes equal. Next day differences would begin to appear and increase as time went on. The children of able, prudent parents would be differentiated from those whose parents were less able. No laws of the state could prevent this. Uniformity today would inevitably become variation tomorrow. Before socialism can introduce uniformity of living, men must be born duplicates of each other. Yet, in none of nature's productions is diversity so great, because man is the highest and most complex of all. We can no more make men equally comfortable through equal incomes than we can make them equal in fortune by distributing the wealth of the country among them. One week after such distribution, there would be thousands penniless and begging their bread, their last state worse than the first. Because revolutionary socialism requires a change in human nature, it calls for scant attention. It is impossible to introduce, much less to maintain, the socialistic state until human nature becomes totally different from what it is now. When the socialist has effected this change, but not before, is the abandonment of the present system worthy of the slightest attention. It is not in order as long as men differ from each other. No two alike, but all equally determined to live each his own life in his own way, this being his nature. This is the law of progress of his race, as it is of plant and animal life. By selection and cultivation of the exceptional animal or plant, that showing the greatest variation from the ordinary type, breeders and cultivators develop the higher orders of life. Thus has come man from the brute. The race has been allowed to develop in freedom, hence, while still savage, the stronger physically was the foremost, and later, under civilization, the strongest mentally have become the leaders, from whom have arisen the select few whose names stand out in history as the exceptional members of our race, whose labors and example, in all the higher domains of human effort, have slowly lifted the race to its present position, infinitely higher than it was only a few hundreds of years ago. Not uniformity, but infinite diversity, ensured this progress, and as far as we can see, it is through diversity alone that the race can continue its upward march. The exceptional man in every department must be permitted and encouraged to develop his unusual powers, tastes, and ambitions in accordance with the laws which prevail in everything that lives or grows. The survival of the fittest means that the exceptional plants, animals, or men which have the needed variations from the common standard are the fructifying forces that leaven the whole. Among these are the great teachers and lawgivers, the poets and statesmen, physicians and historians, the inventors and discoverers, who lead the mass of more uniform pattern onward and upward. The contrast between Shakespeare and the ordinary specimen of humanity is as great as that between the average civilized man and the barbarian. A few pages of this book would hold the names of the truly exceptional men who have distinctly moved the human race forward since history began. Many indeed have contributed there too, and in the widest sense no individual can live a good, useful life without contributing his might to the general wheel. But those who have achieved a decided advance in any one of the innumerable paths of human effort have been few in number, although they built upon the work of many predecessors. Burbank grows hundreds of thousands of plants, sometimes millions, before the exceptional variation appears from which a new variety can be developed, capable of producing superior fruit. So with man, who must be left in perfect freedom, 
as long as he infringes not upon the freedom of others nor injures the state, free to choose his career and live his own life in his own way, the rule being perfect freedom. Limitation of that always exceptional and only exercised when overpowering reasons arise, rendering interference necessary to protect the freedom of others and thus prevent greater evils to the body politic. Under present conditions, which give to all men liberty to carve out their careers, a wool carter hears and obeys the imperious call from on high and gives to man the masterpieces of literature. A precious legacy, according to Lowell, worth more than all the ancient classics. A poor plowman, he who of all men nestles closest to the bosom of humanity, sees the lovely vision that comes to him in his odd clay biggin, and under her guidance he proclaims the royalty of man, exalts honest poverty, strikes down the cruel theology of his day, and hails the unfortunate mouse as his poor earth-born companion and fellow mortal, to him all life being kin. A young man ordered to manage a farm rebels and follows his destiny, and in one word, gravitation, reveals to the world the law that pervades the universe. To two English lads, both remarkable for originality and hard to place, while still groping, the revelation came. Each found his destiny, and from their seclusion, after years of labor, they proclaimed the word which brought order out of chaos, evolution, and man, no longer the supposed degraded creature fallen from his high estate, stands forth today in his majesty, the monarch of all created things, endowed with sublime aspiration for continual ascent, no limit to his future elevation short of perfection. Four hundred years ago, a Scottish boy, soon left an orphan in poverty, the spirit moving within him at maturity, lived to publish the first germ of democracy in Britain, proclaiming that all power resided in the people, and kings were only to be supported as long as they wrought their people's good. Forty years later came one of his pupils, soon also left an orphan, who heard the call of destiny as a disciple of his predecessor. When asked by King James if it were not an offense against God to oppose the Lord's anointed, he replied, Man, you are only the Lord's silly vassal. And largely to these two pioneers of democracy, supported seventy years later in England by him of the organ voice, a poor scrivener, our race owes constitutional government. The son of a French tanner finds his mission and consecrates his life to it. The most horrible of all diseases, hitherto incurable, is conquered, the death rate reduced to one percent. Surgical practice is revolutionized. Later, he rescues the silk industry from an epidemic of fatal character. A working warfinger in Genoa, fired by the gods, sees in imagination what lies over the seas and reveals the new world. A poor student, getting access at last to a small telescope, follows the stars and revolutionizes human conceptions of the planetary system. A German physician, giving gratuitous service to the poor and perforating the walls of his humble dwelling that he might note the stars in their passage, keeping for many years the momentous secret in his bosom, lest the stake were his destiny, at last reveals to the world the Copernican theory. A boy, having learned dentistry, and, in its practice, seeing the agonies of his patients, hears the call to his mission, discovers the antidote in ether, and henceforth in sweet, unconscious sleep, pain finds its conqueror. A German printer apprentice, noted for devotion to his work and studying the means of improvements, finds the answer in movable types, which, through the printed page, make knowledge universal. A Scottish mechanic, making odds and ends for a livelihood, is fascinated by Black's discovery of the latent heat in steam. His life thereafter is concentrated upon the problem of its utilization and the steam engine appears. A working engineer extends its dominion over the sea, a miner stretches it over the land, and the world shrinks into a neighborhood. A printer's lad in Philadelphia, visited by the genii when commercing with the skies, draws electricity from heaven, and the world today is in constant, instantaneous communication. A youth in our day hears the imperious call, and, most mysterious of all, we have wireless communication across the Atlantic. An apprentice to a surgeon, appalled at the ravages of an infectious disease, hears the spirit summons to be up and doing, and a wasting plague is conquered. An American telegraph messenger boy, carried by the gods into the mysterious realm, produces duplex telegraphy, 
gives to the world improved electric lighting, the phonograph, and other wonders, and is still diving into the unknown. Another Scot, still busy with the gods, produces the telephone. Another Scottish mechanic discovers coal gas and uses it for the first time to light his humble home. An English ironmaster invents plans for the use of pit coal instead of charcoal for smelting ironstone. A Scottish lad, who left school at 14, invents the hot blast. And these two Britons revolutionized the manufacture of iron. A German, after years of effort, finally invents a new process of steelmaking, cheapening that indispensable article. A Scottish workman adds the one lacking ingredient. Another German follows with another process, and steel becomes the indispensable slave of progress. Three Englishmen, a handloom weaver, a reed maker, and an apprentice, through their inventions, the fly shuttle, the spinning jenny, and the spinning frame, give the world modern weaving of all manufacturing industries the greatest employer of labor. A poor young American, employed upon the Mississippi in a trading barge, sees for the first time men and women bought and sold upon the auction block, and is stirred by the divine messenger. Leaving the scene, he vows, If ever I get a chance to strike that accursed system, I shall hit it hard. He concentrates himself to his holy mission, and banishes the last vestige of slavery from the civilized world. Pages more could be filled with such instances of beneficent leadership developed under individualism. Seldom, if ever, to the palace or stately home of wealth comes to the messenger of the gods to call men to such honor as follows, supreme service to the race. Rank has no place. Wealth robs life of the heroic element, the sublime consecration, the self-sacrifice of ease, needed for the steady development of our powers and the performance of the highest service. Let workmen note how many of the exceptionals, indicated in the preceding pages, who have carried the race forward were workers with their hands. Shakespeare, Gutenberg, Columbus, K. Morton, Edison, Watt, Murdoch, Jenner, Siemens, Bell, Hargreaves, Nielsen, Bessemer, Arkwright, Stevenson, Lincoln, Mouchette, Franklin, Symington, Burns. All these began as manual workers. There is not one rich nor titled leader in the whole list. All were compelled to earn their bread. Most of them, however, but not all, in due time abandoned labor of the hands, a salutary development, and one which every working man should aspire to. Honorable and necessary as manual labor is, let us gladly greet productive labor of the mind as of a higher order, as the spirit is above the flesh, although it must never be forgotten that in the skilled labor of our day a union of both brain and muscle is imperatively needed. The trained first-class mechanic now works as much with his brain as with his hands, and, if in charge of machinery, much more. The dingy room, the close laboratory, the crowded workshop, and the home of honest poverty contain the exceptionals, capable of carrying forward the mission of the race upon earth, which is in each succeeding generation to make this life a little higher and better. In our day, it is very far from true that labor creates all wealth, and still further from the truth that labor fixes values. But it is very close to the truth that so far the young man reared in poverty, who must work that he may eat, has developed the qualities upon the exercise of which the progress of our race depends. Little has been contributed in the past by either the rich or the titled to the world's advancement, and little can be expected in the future. These classes lack the spur of necessity, and being well-placed, naturally rest contented. So would the poor were positions reversed. This is human nature as it exists in our day. The exceptional rich man or youth who scorns delights and lives laborious days, there are a few such, deserves double honor. Under our present individualistic system, which breeds and develops the needed leaders, there is no state official to interpose, no communism, no uniformity, no commission to consider respective claims of the exceptionals and decide upon their destinies. All are left in perfect freedom, and in the possession of glorious liberty of choice, free, by the sole act of their own unlorded will, 
to obey the divine call, which consecrates each to his great mission. One point is clear. Nothing should be done that would tend to reduce diversity of talents in our race, and everything should be done to increase it if possible. For it is through variation the progress of the race has been achieved and is to come, and progress is the chief end of existence. This is what we are here for, as is proven by the fact that progress from the lower to the higher has prevailed from the time this earth cooled and life began to appear. This is our godlike mission, that every individual in his day and generation push on this march upward, so that each succeeding generation may be better than the preceding. Not one of us can feel his duty done, unless he can say as he approaches his end, that because he has lived, some fellow creature or some little spot of earth or something upon it has been made just a little better. Nor is this beyond the reach of the humblest, for all can at least render to others that best portion of a good man's life, his little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love. End of section 18. Variety versus Uniformity. Recording by Kat Din in Osaka, Japan. Section 19 of The Empire of Business by Andrew Carnegie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kat Din in Osaka, Japan. The Empire of Business. Section 19. Family Relations. Family Relations. The most serious objection to socialism one hesitates to name, but this cannot well be avoided. We gladly believe that most of the so-called socialists of our English-speaking race would repudiate it, and yet it is clear that the system would naturally tend to produce, at least in some degree, the effects feared. We refer to the foremost of civilization's triumphs, the creation of the happy home, the product of man and woman holily married with the blessings of children coming to them to give us here a taste of heaven on earth. Of all that evolution has given man during the long, slow march of ages, from savagery till now, this is the crown. Take this away, and to millions who possess it, the best of the race, life becomes undesirable. The holy of holies is the pure and happy home. We have been treating of wealth, land, labor. Changes regarding these are unimportant compared with threatened changes in our family relations. That way degradation lies. Here rests the most precious root of all that elevates, refines, and improves human nature. The writer would gladly have omitted reference to this feature of socialism, but he felt it could not be ignored. One looks in vain through the booklets so far published for a repudiation of the sentiments of socialistic leaders, both past and present, who admit that family relations must be greatly changed under socialism. The writer confesses it was with surprise that he found several modern and well-known writers going so far in the direction of accepting the doctrine that socialism compelled this change. The first exponent of modern socialism, Fourier, is responsible for this taint, although even Owen quarreled with accepted views of marriage, so that it is not a recent development. It appears advisable that the best-known writers among acknowledged socialists especially those of our own race occupying eminent positions, should give this feature prompt attention and, we trust, public repudiation. We quote from The Case Against Socialism, pages 374 to 398. We have the admission of the leading English socialist historian of socialism, in no less a work than the Encyclopedia Britannica, that, in the Marx School, which in socialism is by far the most important in this as in other countries, there is a tendency to denounce the legally binding contract in marriage. The connection, however, bases itself upon this, as treated by Lamartine in his celebrated history of the French Revolution of 1848. Communism of goods leads, as a necessary consequence, to communism of wives, children, and parents, and to the brutalization of the species. Other historians have arrived at a like conclusion. Not only this, but socialist leaders have themselves admitted all that Lamartine here asserts, save only his last conclusion. Jaeger, in his Socialismus, observes that the possession of land and soil in common, if it arises out of materialism, 
leads also to community of wives as being another expression of materialistic communism. In his essay treating of socialism and sex, Professor Carl Pearson, said to be one of the most distinguished of socialist writers in this country, writes, With the centuries as the last traces of the patriarchate vanish, as woman obtains rights as an individual, when a new form of possession is coming into existence, is it rational to suppose that history will break its hitherto invariable law and that a new sex relationship will not replace the old? In a later passage, Professor Pearson throws further light upon the nature of this new sex relationship. In his essay, he informs us that woman will be the physical and mental equal of man in any sex partnership they may agree to enter upon. For such woman, I hold that the sex relationship, both as to form and substance, ought to be a pure question of taste, a simple matter of agreement between the man and her, in which neither society nor the state would have any need or right to interfere. This latter conclusion Professor Pearson proceeds to modify in the case where the sex relationship does result in children. Then, so Professor Pearson emphatically declares, the state will have a right to interfere, and apparently, in the writer's opinion, will be forced to interfere. One of the greatest of French socialist writers, M. Gabriel Deville, in advocating the suppression of marriage under socialism and the substitution of free love, summarizes the principal reasons which account for the inherent antipathy to the continuance of marriage on the part of socialism, saying, Marriage is a regulation of property, a business contract before being a union of persons, and its utility grows out of the economic structure of a society which is based upon individual appropriation. By giving guarantees to the legitimate children and ensuring to them the paternal capital, It perpetuates the domination of the caste, which monopolizes the productive forces. When property is transformed, and only after that transformation, marriage will lose its reason for existence. Bebel, the great international socialist leader, in his Woman and Socialism, translated into English under the title of Woman, Her Past, Present, and Future, expresses much of the same views as Deville in the following passage. The bourgeois marriage is a consequence of bourgeois property. This marriage, standing as it does in the most intimate connection to property and the right of inheritance, demands the legitimate children as heirs. It is entered into for the purpose of obtaining them, and the pressure exercised by society has enabled the ruling classes to enforce it in the case of those who have nothing to bequeath. But, as in the new community, there will be nothing to bequeath. Compulsory marriage becomes unnecessary from this standpoint, as well as from all others. The existing of monogamic relation, write two of the foremost leaders of English socialism, Mr. Belfort Bax and Mr. H. Quelch, concerning marriage, is simply the outcome of the institution of private or individual property. When private property ceases to be the fulcrum around which the relations between the sexes turn, any attempt at coercion, moral or material, must necessarily become repugnant to the moral sense of the community. Lecky says, It is perfectly true that marriage and the family form the taproot out of which the whole system of hereditary property grows, and that it would be utterly impossible permanently to extirpate heredity unless family stability and family affection were annihilated. Mr. Hepworth Dixon, who has devoted special study to the actual working of communistic societies, observes that the fact remained and in time it became known that Fourier's system could not be reconciled any more than Owen's system could be reconciled. With the partition of mankind into those special groups called families, in which people live together a life devised by nature, under the close relation of husband and wife, of parent and child. The very first conception of a socialistic state is such a relation of the sexes, again writes Mr. Hepworth Dixon, as shall prevent men and women from falling into selfish family groups. Family life is eternally at war with social life. When you have a private household, you must have personal property to feed it. Hence, a community of goods, the first idea of a social state, has been found in every case to imply a community of children and to promote a community of wives. That you cannot have socialism without introducing communism is the teaching of all experience. Whether the trials have been made on a large scale or on a small scale, in the old world or in the new. The late Mr. William Morris, in company with Mr. Belfort Bax, 
has written in denunciation of the present sham morality, the aim of which is the perpetuation of individual property in wealth, in workman, in wife, in child. Later, the same authors tell us on the advent of social economic freedom that children would cease to exist. Thus, they state, a new development of the family would take place on the basis not of a predetermined lifelong business arrangement to be formally and nominally held to, irrespective of circumstances, but on mutual inclination and affection, an association terminable at the will of either party. There would be no vestige of reprobation weighing on the dissolution of one tie and the forming of another. Mrs. Snowden, in her recently published book, The Woman Socialist, informs her readers, It is more than probable that the ordinary church marriage service will be abolished, but it ought to be abolished. Under socialism, the marriage service will probably be a simple declaration on the part of the contracting parties before the civil representatives of the state. To much the same effect writes Professor Carl Pearson, Such then seems to me the socialistic solution of the sex problem complete freedom in the sex relationship left to the judgment and taste of an economically equal, physically trained, and intellectually developed race of men and women. State interference, if necessary, in the matter of childbearing in order to preserve intersexual independence on the one hand and the limit of efficient population on the other. The socialistic movement with its new morality and the movement for sex equality, writes Professor Pearson in an earlier passage, must surely and rapidly undermine our current marriage customs and marriage law. Mr. H. M. Heinemann predicts under socialism the complete change in all family relations, which must issue in a widely extended communism. M. Jules Ged, one of the leaders of international socialism, writes, The family was useful and indispensable in the past, but is now only an odious form of property. It must be either transformed or abolished. There are other quotations in the book named, which we refrain from quoting. In judging socialism, we are forced to consider this aspect of the question and see where it leads us. The opinions expressed, we trust, are not accepted by many socialists of our own race. What concerns us is whether the result of the socialistic system tends to change or destroy marriage and present family life as it exists today. Socialism, with its equal conditions of life and equal incomes, must tend to evolve the common assembling room, the aggregation of members in one common building, and all the features of the barracks. Mrs. Besant pictures these conditions public meal rooms, large dwellings which are to replace old-fashioned cottages, one great kitchen, one dining hall, and one pleasant tea garden. The result of all this must be to destroy the home as we know it, and tend to substitute the ideal of the socialist, all people being brethren and members of one family and one home, hereditary wealth and hereditary blood relationships abolished, father and son, wife and mother, sisters and brothers no more to each other than other members of the one great socialistic household. The ties of kindred, even of father and mother and children, must eventually sink into one common affection for all. All are to stand upon an equality of relationship, one to the other, under the sway of socialism, in respect of homes, property, food, dress, and all other things. Even the children are to be taken care of by the state. But if any provide not for his own, and specially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel, becomes obsolete, for the home of socialism is not to be individualistic, but communistic. It becomes the socialist's duty, henceforth, to provide for all as for his own they being members of one great household and one family. Such is apparently the final aim of the extreme socialist. This would mean a second fall of man. Farewell to human happiness in its purest, most elevating, most entrancing form. Destroy our home life as it exists today, and we may well lament that the wine of life is drawn, and the mere lees is left this vault to brag of. Just as socialism goes back to the savage past and urges man to return to communism, so seemingly it contemplates the return of men and women to barbarism in their holiest relations, if we are compelled to accept literally some of the writers quoted in the case against socialism as true exponents of the new system. The laws of Britain, compared with those of America, are less favorable to women, and those of continental nations still less so. Under American laws, 
She has proper standing, proving the estimation in which she is held by American men in all the relations of life. Socialism being a continental outgrowth, the references made to women by French and German socialistic writers, some of which we have ventured to quote, shock our sense of what is due to beings who, in their highest development, are capable of reaching heights unattainable by men. It is earnestly to be hoped that the respected leaders of socialism will deal effectively with this phase of the question by repudiating the sentiments expressed. A pagan philosopher, weighing the claims of Christ to rank among the great teachers, would probably give first place to what he did for the elevation of woman. Civilized man, in his upward march, has not only outgrown, he has reversed the Miltonic idea of Adam and Eve. For contemplation he and valor formed, for softness she and sweet attractive grace. He for God only, she for God in him. In the happiest and holiest homes of today, it is not the man who leads the wife upward, but the infinitely purer and more angelic wife whom the husband reverently follows upon the heavenly path as the highest embodiment of all the virtues that have been revealed to him. He for God in her. Throughout the English-speaking race as a rule today, it is the wife and mother who sanctifies the home. If all the dreams of the wildest socialist were realities purchasable at the cost of the present happy home of individualism, with wife and children, the sacrifice were too great, the blow to our civilization would be fatal. End of section 19, Family Relations. Recording by Kat Din in Osaka, Japan. Section 20 of The Empire of Business by Andrew Carnegie. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook. The Empire of Business, Section 20, The Long March Upward. If man had been created perfect, but with an instinct for his own degradation, and if he had fallen so low in the scale as to become unfit longer to live, then indeed his future might well be despaired of. But when we know that instead of this he has developed slowly from the lower orders of life, constantly ascending in the scale, century after century, for many thousands, perhaps millions of years, moving steadily towards perfection, we can indulge in the confident expectation that there can be no retrogression we behold him and exclaim, quote, What a piece of work is a man! How noble in reason! How infinite in faculty! In form and moving, how express and admirable! In action, how like an angel! In apprehension, how like a god! End quote. Only through exceptional individuals, the leaders, man has been able to ascend. He is imitative, and what he sees another do, he attempts and generally succeeds in doing. It is the leaders who do the new things that count, and all these have been individualistic to a degree beyond ordinary men and worked in perfect freedom, each and every one a character unlike anybody else, an original, gifted beyond others of his kind, hence his leadership. Men are not created alike. On the contrary, there is infinite variety, not only in the powers bestowed, but also in their degree. For the fruits of men's lives depend as much upon the amount of the same powers shared with others as upon different powers inherited. The earth was at first only a ball of fire thrown off from our sun, no life possible upon it till it cooled, millions of years probably elapsing before a green leaf could appear. Then, after vegetation arose, came a life from the ooze of the sea, and finally from the higher order of life there was developed primitive man, of whom the Veda remains our nearest type, described as living in trees and crawling down to feed on what he can find, unable to walk upright until he gains more food as summer advances. Man lingered long in the savage state, and, like other wild beasts, his chief occupation was war upon his kind eating as well as killing his captives. Subsequently he developed into the barbaric stage, not quite so much of the wild beast. He began building huts, 
sometimes cultivating the ground, always improving upon, never permanently falling so low as its predecessor. After unnumbered years of such storm and stress, we of today have become more civilized, more peaceable. The arts of peace, not those of war, our occupation. We have reached the industrial age with its problems. This we are called upon to study and discuss, never fearing that the power within us, which decrees unceasing improvement, will not enable us to continue to tread the upward path. We shall make mistakes as usual, but the human organism feels its way surely, though slowly, drawing back its tentacles whenever they touch deleterious soil, groping again until fertile ground is found, and then the next step forward is taken. Thus the organism never moves far until the right path is discovered. It is on the constant search for nutriment, and discards all that is injurious. If it now and then swallows an indigestible mouthful, it promptly spews it out. Hence its constant march onward and upward. It has never met a difficulty which it has not surmounted. It bears a charmed life. All this Herbert Spencer has clearly revealed. It is a healthful sign when there is unrest and dissatisfaction, and zealous, even extreme, advocates of change clamoring for better things in quicker march. Divine discontent is the root of progress, and even our socialistic friends, with their revolutionary ideas, stir the waters for good if we reason soberly together and test their proposed remedies before we forsake the path which has so far led our race upwards from the brute to civilized manhood. By the nature of its being, the one rule which the human race can never persistently violate is that which proclaims, quote, hold fast to that which has proved itself good, end quote. Complaint against our socialistic friends is not that they do not mean well. On the contrary, no class is moved by worthier impulses. Their hearts are in the right place, and one cannot but sometimes admire their aspirations. Thus Keir Hardy writes, quote, Surely it is reasonable to hope that a day will dawn in which a desire to serve, rather than to be served, shall be the spur which shall drive men onward to noble deeds. There is perfect agreement on two leading points of principle, hostility to militarism in all its forms, and to war as the method of settling disputes between nations is the first. End quote. George Eliot says somewhere that she could imagine a coming day when the effort to assist a fellow being in trouble would be as involuntary as it now is to clutch one stumbling and in danger of falling to the ground. Such hopes and aspirations are not confined to socialists. They are held by hosts of good individualists. Let these be freely indulged. Under individualism, the race is ever developing the generous impulses. Altruism grows as time rolls on. Never was civilized man his brother's keeper to such an extent as in our day. Socialistic conditions are not required to produce healthy growth in this direction. Where we differ from the socialists is as to the advisability of any violent change from individualism, which is guided and is still guiding in the direction desired through the continual improvement of present conditions. We believe that the surest and best way to obtain more service from men to their less fortunate fellows is by continued evolution as in the past, instead of by revolutionary socialism, which spends its time preaching such changes as are not within measurable distance of attainment, even if they were desirable in themselves. We feel that socialists neglect the immediate duty of their day and generation, and vainly attempt to provide for a distant and unknown future of the race which alone can determine its own wants in its own day. Their revolutionary outbursts alarm the timid and conservative, and hence threaten to delay and perhaps to frustrate for a generation many desirable advances, which the moderate wing of their own party ardently desire, especially in Britain. The extreme socialists themselves are one of the obstacles to substantial progress today. On the other hand, the timid and conservative must not fail to remember that grave and unjust inequalities prevail in connection with the land. 
non-taxation of site values, plural voting, and unequal electoral districts in Britain, also in taxation not according to ability to pay, and unequal distribution of wealth common to all countries. And they also should remember that the surest and indeed the only way of ensuring a contended people is promptly to recognize and redress these and other evils. It would be futile to indulge the belief that the masses of Britain will much longer be content to see their fellows in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and America enjoying free land without primogeniture or settlements, and sites taxed at true values, equality of voting power through equal electoral districts, one man, one vote, payment of members, complete control over the liquor traffic, yearly licenses at high rates and freely cancelled, and local option rapidly spreading. Equality with their fellows across the seas must soon become the cry, and the sooner this is granted, the better, that the steady march of evolutionary development, so fruitful in the past, so necessary for the future, may continue to hold peaceful sway in the land where freedom broadens slowly down. The pace of reform for some years has been much too slow as compared with progress and ideas. The day is coming when kindred institutions shall prevail in all the nations of our race, that which proved advantageous in one being promptly adopted by all the others. Thus shall be laid the foundations of a lasting and beneficent imperialism of race, whose influence in the councils of the world, always pleading for peaceful arbitration of disputes, will lead to the reign of peace and the brotherhood of man. One parting word to our well-meaning but, as I believe, misled socialist friends. To be born to honest poverty and compelled to labor and strive for a livelihood in youth is the best of all schools for developing latent qualities, strengthening character, and making useful men. Hence from this school have come our leaders. It is well that man should go forth to his work in the morning and labor until the evening. Work is no punishment. It is a blessing. Steady work is also the best preservative of the virtues. No substitute for it has yet been found. Man has not been placed in this world to play and amuse himself. He is entrusted with a serious mission, and has onerous duties to perform, not to a future generation, but to his own. And he who fails to labor for the improvement of this, our own life of today, does not deserve another. To advocate speculative schemes for a future of which we can know nothing is folly, and worse, for the revolutionary ideas so rashly proclaimed by the socialists alarm sober-minded conservative men and drive them into the ranks of those who oppose the salutary reforms needed in our day, which could otherwise be easily won. Socialists evolutionary, socialists halfway, socialists revolutionary. We are here to attend to the pressing wants of our own age, not to obstruct the steady, orderly march of progress by basing action upon the startling assumption that in a distant and unknown future individualism, under which man has steadily advanced, is to be supplanted by communism. This is to lose the substance by grasping for the shadow and waste our time like children chasing rainbows and crying for the moon. End of section 20. Section 21 of The Empire of Business by Andrew Carnegie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joanne Turner. The Empire of Business, Section 21. My Experience with Railway Rates and Rebates. This subject carries one back to his early days. It was in 1856 that my chief, Thomas A. Scott, superintendent of the Pittsburgh Division of the Pennsylvania Railroad, was made general superintendent with headquarters at Altoona. I was his secretary and telegraph operator in Pittsburgh, and he took me with him. The duties of the superintendent of the line, then in its infancy, included the making of local freight rates. 
These I entered in the rate book and naturally grew to take a share in their making. Our great aim in those days was to develop local traffic. Of through traffic, little was expected. Although President Thompson, the great railroad man of his day, had ventured to predict that a hundred carloads of through freight would in time pass Pittsburgh daily. This prophecy was often quoted to show the length to which that sanguine but far-sighted official could go. Now every day thousands pass through the city in each direction. Local traffic, that is, traffic originating and ending upon the line, was then depended upon to yield revenue. One enterprising man would write or call to say that he was thinking of opening a stone quarry on the line and shipping dressed stone to the towns and cities if he could get rates enabling him to do so. Because traffic paying much less than we might think fair was better than no traffic at all, we would hold out every inducement to pioneers with the result that the quarry was opened. Another was willing to make the experiment of cutting bark and shipping it to tanneries, intending later, however, to erect a tannery in the forest. Here was a tempting new enterprise, and rates were readily agreed upon. Another thought a peculiar quality of sand was suitable for glassmaking and was willing to open the deposit and test it. He was promptly accorded a siding, which was usually necessary, and rates low enough to permit him to begin. The plot began to thicken when a second man came with a proposition to open another similar factory or quarry, which he could not do unless he received rates equal to those given to his predecessor, although his railway hall might be longer. If two factories were to be only a few miles apart, it was obvious that they had to receive the same rates. And so the question of special rates, starting very simply, soon became a complicated one. Areas had to be established in which the rates were uniform, although this involved the seeming injustice of charging more per ton per mile upon the traffic of one than of the other. This could not be avoided. At a later date, corporations were found desirous of establishing ironworks and of opening coal mines, etc. From such small beginnings was built up the enormous local traffic of the Pennsylvania Railroad, unequaled, it is believed, by any other line in the world. All these rates, it will be understood, referred to traffic within the state of Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh and Philadelphia being the terminals of the line. Beyond Philadelphia was the Camden and Amboy Railway. Beyond Pittsburgh, the Fort Wayne and Chicago, separate organizations with which we had nothing to do. During this period, through traffic occupied an entirely subordinate position. Rates for it were made in Philadelphia by a freight agent who then was an official of little importance compared with what he soon became. Upon the completion of the Erie, New York Central, Baltimore and Ohio, and the Pennsylvania systems between the Atlantic seaboard and the Great West, a strong competition for through traffic once began. At first it was a scramble, and each road got what it could at the best rate it could, regardless of everything. The position was peculiar and is so still and must long remain so. Eastbound tonnage from Chicago, St. Louis, and other points in the west to the Atlantic seaboard is far greater than that from the east to the west. Hence, long trains of empty freight cars have to be hauled westward empty. It is evident why westward-bound freight was eagerly sought by all lines. Each had its freight agents all scrambling to secure the prize. What rates might be obtained for westbound freight was a secondary consideration, 
for any rate was clear gain. Since cars must go west in any case and might as well go loaded as empty. Hence, bitter wars broke out between the roads at intervals, and the four presidents would meet and make what was called a gentleman's agreement. These worthy presidents would give their word of honor that certain rates would be strictly adhered to, and gave orders to that effect, we may be sure, in good faith to their subordinates. But it is a remarkable fact, notwithstanding, that these gentlemen's agreements did not last long, but required renewal at short intervals. The rates agreed upon were too easily evaded. The assistant freight agent or one of his staff could promise certain favors to shippers upon other traffic, while adhering strictly to the agreed-upon charge for that he was securing or could remit charges upon other freight not involved in the agreement. So gentlemen's agreements were made and remade, but meanwhile, freight from Pittsburgh was often sent by way of the Ohio River, some 500 miles to Cincinnati, transferred from boat to railroad car there, and transported back to Pittsburgh by rail passing through its streets to the seaboard for less than the fixed rate upon the same articles from Pittsburgh direct to the seaboard. It was the same with freight from the east to the west. Many a trainload of iron from the east has passed through the streets of Pittsburgh, paying less freight than was charged upon the same articles from Pittsburgh to the same points west. The Pennsylvania Railroad had a monopoly of the traffic, and much grievous wrong had we manufacturers in that state to suffer in consequence. We must not be understood as blaming the Pennsylvania officials severely. They did not raise our Pittsburgh rates, and these in themselves might be considered fair but they lowered the rates to our competitors in their warfare with the trunk lines. This bore hard upon the manufacturers of Pennsylvania, and especially of Pittsburgh. It would have been a wiser and broader policy if the Pennsylvania Railroad had been bold enough to say, come what may, we will protect manufacturers upon our own lines but it required more than the ordinary railroad official of that day to reach this height. A perfect system of rates over the various routes could not be reached without first passing for a season through great irregularities and making many mistakes. Order had to be hammered out of chaos. These were the days when the much-talked-of rebates had their origin. Gentlemen's agreement rates were charged, and the bills of lading were fair and square on the surface, but the understanding with the shipper was that rebates would be allowed and settled for at some future time. The keener members soon discovered that evidence might be called for by competing lines, and the question asked, have any rebates been paid on this shipment? The party concerned might be able to say that he had paid none, but had he been questioned a month or two afterward, perhaps, or asked if advantages in other directions had not been granted to the shipper, he could not have so stated truthfully. In short, every conceivable way of keeping the word of promise to the ear and breaking it to the hope was indulged in. At least we shippers over the Pennsylvania Road heard from its officials from time to time that the other lines were most unscrupulous competitors and solely blamable for the reigning disorder. The sentiment aroused in Pittsburgh because of these unequal rates became dangerous. The Pennsylvania Railroad was regarded as a monopoly strangling to local interests, and so it was. The manufacturers of Pittsburgh, never in a position to get rebates, were in fact being driven to the wall by the competition of manufacturers upon other lines 
whose products passed their doors and were carried a thousand miles over the Pennsylvania system for less than they were compelled to pay for half the distance. Remonstrances were constantly made, but without avail, until the time came when the railway company had a dispute with its men, which gave occasion for an outburst of the smoldering bitterness Pittsburgh felt. Grave riots took place, and the spirit of hostility shown by all classes to the great monopoly brought from Philadelphia, my former chief, then vice president, to Pittsburgh. At a conference with the manufacturers, it was agreed by him that no matter what the through rates fell to, the local traffic on the lines from Pittsburgh would be carried to Chicago or Philadelphia and New York at a small difference, less than the through rate between the seaboard and Chicago and other points. That is to say, Pittsburgh traffic would be charged only a shade less for half the distance than Philadelphia and Chicago through traffic paid for double the distance. Rates according to distance were denied. With this, the Pittsburgh manufacturers had to be content. Matters went along tolerably well until railway rates were again thoroughly demoralized by war between the trunk lines. Our Carnegie Steel Company, upon this occasion, had had what it thought the certainty of a contract of great value for material with the Newport News Shipbuilding Company, freight from Pittsburgh to Newport News being much less than from Chicago. The contract, however, went to Chicago, and upon investigation, we found that the rate given to our Chicago competitor to Newport News was less than the Pennsylvania Railroad rate from Pittsburgh, the distance not one-half so great. President Ingalls of the Chesapeake and Ohio, then beginning his brilliant career, had made the lower rate for his new line not yet embraced in the Gentleman's Agreement. We investigated and found several rates of a similar nature prevailing to other points, and having a list of these made, the writer carried it to President Roberts of the Pennsylvania Railroad with a request that he place us upon his own line on an equality with manufacturers on other lines. When the paper was presented to him, showing the overcharges we labored under, he pushed it aside, saying, I have enough business of my own to attend to. Don't wish to have anything to do with yours, Andy. I said, all right, Mr. Roberts. When you wish to see me again, you will ask an interview. Good morning. The situation had become intolerable, and we looked about for the best means of protecting ourselves. A railroad line of our own, from Pittsburgh to the Lakes, would be an invaluable acquisition, rendering us independent of any monopoly and enabling us to transport all our ironstone traffic from the lakes to Pittsburgh and our coal and coke from Pittsburgh to the lakes, also giving us connection with the other through lines. I purchased the harbor at Conneaut and a few miles of railroad connected with it and began extending the line to Pittsburgh. My partners had good reason to dread the consequences of the reckless challenge to the monster monopoly, and I could not blame them, for it undoubtedly had the power to cripple our operations. An intimation to the superintendent that the car supply for our works or the movement of our traffic need not receive undue attention would be serious indeed. As a precaution, I took good care that the authorities in Philadelphia were advised of the policy I had determined to pursue if there was the slightest interruption to our business. All our works would be stopped. I would visit each in succession and inform the workmen why they were idle, publish the monopoly rates, explain why Pittsburgh needed our new railroad, and ask them and all the workmen from other mills 
to stand with folded arms upon the streets over which the Pennsylvania trains passed for miles, in peaceful protest and as an intimation that justice had better be done to Pittsburgh. No interference with our operations came. It was not long before I received a note from Vice President Thompson saying that President Roberts and himself would like an interview. I agreed to call as I passed through Philadelphia and did so. I write this in the first person because my partners did not see their way to fight the Great Pennsylvania Railroad, but my Scotch blood was up and I was in to fight to the death, determined no longer to stand what we had been groaning under. It was indeed a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a railroad monopoly in those early days, and yet this is to be said for the railroad. While its rates for competitive traffic were being reduced beyond reason by competition, the company needed all the more the high rates upon local traffic if these could be enforced. This was no doubt taking a very narrow view, but railroading was then in its infancy, and public sentiment was not the force it has since become. What I needed for the interview with my former railway associates were the secret rebate rates prevailing elsewhere. Our freight agent, Mr. McCaig, then a clever young man, obtained these and placed them in my hands in a few days. He had left me with the word of Richelieu ringing in his ears. From the hour I grasp that packet, think your guardian star rains fortune on you. Sometime after that he was of course admitted to partnership. That was the turning point in his career. Entering President Roberts' room, I found him and my dear friend Frank Thompson, Vice President, sitting together. My reception was cordial. How are you, Andy? How are you, Mr. Roberts? How are you, Frank? Gentlemen, you asked me for an interview, and here is the culprit before you. Put me in the dock and question me as you wish. Frank said, This is just what we want to do. May I be examiner? Yes, I said. You are just the man. What are you fighting the Pennsylvania Railroad for? He asked. You were brought up in its service. We were boys together. Well, Frank, I knew you would ask me that question, and here is the answer. I handed him the packet of secret rates and, begging to be excused for a few minutes, left the room, desirous of giving them an opportunity of looking it over together. Upon my return, they were still sitting with the packet lying before them. Frank raised his head and exclaimed, Andy, I feel like Rip Van Winkle. Frank, the Pennsylvania Railroad officials have slept just about as long. Well, tell us what you want. I don't want anything. I did not ask to see you. You asked to see me. Don't talk that way. What do you want? We wish to make an arrangement satisfactory to you. We did not know these things were going on. We can hardly believe it, but we shall now find out. Tell us what you think we ought to do. I said, gentlemen, all we have ever asked was that the rates charged us shall be at all times as low as those which competitors on other lines are paying on the same articles for similar distances. We ask for nothing else. Other lines are carrying freight for our competitors cheaper than you are carrying it for us, and you take part of this freight at the cut rates. We cannot stand that. We have never asked for lower rates than our competitors, but we shall never rest satisfied with less. If you will stop building that line from the lakes to your works, we will do what you ask, was his response. Gentlemen, that cannot be. I have agreed to build that line, and certain parties have taken action in consequence of my promise. It has to be built. Repeated efforts were made to induce me to forego building, until finally I said to President Roberts, You have just given a rival concern about to build works on your line in Pittsburgh, 
an agreement to give them everything you give us. We make no complaint, but if I had come to you and asked you, Mr. Roberts, to withdraw that agreement, and you had told me you were pledged to give it, I should say no more. I should expect you to keep your word. If abandoning the new line is a condition of anything you will do for us, we must part. No more was said upon that subject. Then came the extension of the lake line we had decided to build from Pittsburgh to our Coke ovens. They wished that stopped, and as I was not yet pledged to build it, I said that was a matter for negotiation. If they wished to carry our Coke over their line from the ovens to our works at Pittsburgh at the same rate agreed upon with the new proposed line for that service, they could have the contract. This they gladly accepted. The result of the meeting was that I got all I asked for and greatly obliged the Pennsylvania Railroad by allowing them to retain transportation of our own coke traffic from the coke fields to Pittsburgh. Everything was satisfactorily arranged, and we were all boys together again. I was the ally of the PRR, much to my delight. It was estimated that the agreement saved us about one and a half millions of dollars per year, a large sum upon our business then. Railway officials, free from restrictions, could make or unmake mining and manufacturing concerns in those days, and could do so still had we not at last a court of appeal and laws against obvious discriminations. The Interstate Commerce Commission is to become one of our greatest safeguards. I must not forget to mention that one part of the understanding was that so long as the Pennsylvania Railroad gave us the same rates our competitors paid for similar distances anywhere in the United States, we would not be parties to building any additional lines in the Pittsburgh district in competition with the Pennsylvania Railroad, and this agreement lasted until Mr. Cassatt returned to power. I was in Europe when he changed the coke and other rates, not knowing their origin or the details of our agreement with his predecessors. All that we asked and obtained, as I have explained, was the same rates given by other lines to our competitors, and nothing lower than these. It was impossible, I am told, for the railroad company to do anything, however, but charge the regular rates on some of our shipments as made, and at the end of each month to compare these rates with any they had given to others, or which we could show their competitors had given to others, for similar traffic. Therefore, the necessary deductions, if any, that had to be made to us might be considered in one sense technically rebates upon the higher rates charged, although not such in any true sense. For the net result to us was that, according to the agreement, we got just the rates that the Pennsylvania Railroad officials were satisfied our competitors were paying in other districts over other lines. Thus, we were given, as it were, the most favored nation clause, nothing more. The new rate on Coke was in a different category. Here, the Pennsylvania Railroad Company elected to take the place of a threatened rival railroad and had to meet its terms. The Carnegie Steel Company only got what the new line was to give it. The efforts of Pittsburgh manufacturers to escape the thrall of the great monopoly were, first, the making of an independent line to the lakes and connecting with the New York and Erie, New York Central, etc., which was done, but subsequently sold to the Vanderbilt interests, who offered $3 for one invested. It proved to be a great mistake to sell because it permitted the two railroad systems to confer and come to terms upon fixed rates and probably division of traffic. Thus ended effort number one. Sometime after, 
when war again broke out between the rival systems, the late William H. Vanderbilt asked me what I thought of the project of his able and enterprising son-in-law, Mr. Twombly, to extend the reading system to Pittsburgh through Pennsylvania. I thought so well of it that I said, if you will undertake it, I and my friends will go with you to the extent of $5 million, a prodigious sum then, at least to us. If you will, then I will put in $5 million also, he replied. Thus the South Pennsylvania was organized and its construction begun. Here was a chance for the New York Central to grip and hold its antagonist by the throat, but the Pennsylvania interests, seeing what the movement involved, approached Mr. Vanderbilt while I was absent in Europe and induced him to surrender. Exactly what advantage the New York Central system received, I do not know. But it should have been great indeed, for this was probably the greatest mistake in its history. Mr. Twombly had found the key to masterdom for the Vanderbilt interests, but it was foolishly thrown away. The work on the South Pennsylvania was stopped and our investment returned. Thus ended effort number two. My personal effort to build the Bessemer Railroad to the lakes came after these vain efforts of United Pittsburgh to emancipate herself. When Mr. Cassatt ended the agreement entered into between his predecessor and myself, I was quite prepared to take up the challenge. We were once more free. An idea struck me one morning. I called upon Mr. George Gould and said to him, Years ago, soon after I had taken up residence in New York, your father approached me in the Windsor Hotel and said he would buy the control of the Pennsylvania Railroad and divide profits equally with me if I would promise to devote myself to its management. It was a great compliment to be paid to one so young, but my heart was already in steel development, and I declined. This morning I come to you and offer an opportunity to create and control a through line from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Extend your line to Pittsburgh, and we will give you a contract for one-third of all our business, provided you agree to give us the rates prevailing elsewhere and enjoyed by our competitors. I offered to build west to meet him, and also to join him in building east. Fortunately, he agreed, and the result is that the Gould system today is in Pittsburgh enjoying that contract. We were just upon the eve of arranging to extend the line eastward, taking in our coke works and route, which would have been a hard blow to the Pennsylvania Railroad, since we controlled our own coke traffic, when Mr. Morgan asked Mr. Schwab if I wished to retire from business. If so, he thought he could let me out. I replied in the affirmative, having resolved early in life not to spend my old age struggling for more dollars. I had seen so many pitiable cases of men with fortunes to retire upon, but nothing to retire to, condemned to continue like flies held fast by the revolving wheel, to whom change means misery. Of course, we stopped all negotiations looking to eastern extension after this, and the result was my retirement from business. With Mr. Cassatt's return to power as president of the Pennsylvania system came needed reform, and it gives me pleasure to record the great service that companion of my youth did to the railroad interests of the country. In doing so, he broke the Constitution of Pennsylvania, which prohibits any of its railroads from controlling competing lines by purchase or otherwise. He bought large interests in the Baltimore and Ohio and other competing lines. But when he did this, I do not believe he knew he was breaking the Constitution, for in those days railway officials thought little about the law because it rarely touched transportation operations. 
These investments have since been sold by the Pennsylvania Company. His influence upon competing lines became decisive. He enforced uniform rates honestly on the Pennsylvania system, and he gradually induced the other lines to adhere to them. Then was established what is called the, quote, community of interest, unquote, idea. In the interval, the government had taken up the subject of interstate commerce, which the states were and are clearly unable to control. Wise laws were passed and a national commission appointed, and the evils of rebates are today already unknown. Under present laws, no corporation can afford to offer, neither can any person or company afford to receive, rebates, the risk of exposure and punishment being now fortunately far too great. Thus, the conditions described as prevailing in the past in railway transportation, then still in the formative stage, are rapidly being succeeded by a system finally to become as perfect as is possible for a man to create and maintain. The President has performed a great service, focusing the attention of the country upon certain crying evils, and the present position of the government is all that could be desired. The dead past is to bury its past. It is rapidly doing so. It was the custom for different rates to prevail in the beginning of railroad development when all was chaos, but our conditions are soon to be those which the old lands have been led by experience to establish. We are only following their example in supervising railway and other corporations strictly, as we do national banks. Leases, mergers, purchases of shares, control of other lines or corporations, the issue of bonds and stocks, and the rates of freight must all be reported, examined, and approved by the tribunal which is to become our industrial Supreme Court. We may rest assured that the Interstate Commission, progressing from year to year as it gains experience, will sustain fair rates for the railroad companies and establish what is indispensable equality of rates throughout the whole country. The equality of the shipper will soon become an axiom ranking with the equality of the citizen. One shipper's privilege over any railroad, every shipper's right. Different rates per ton or per mile may prevail in different sections or under different conditions, but these will be open to all. This will give to shareholders in corporations a degree of security hitherto unknown, enhance the value of their investments, and prove as beneficial for the corporations as for the shareholders and the country. Capital, both domestic and foreign, will be attracted more than ever to this field. The creation of the Commission is the most important addition that has been made in our day to the machinery of government. It should be proclaimed by the administration and leading statesmen of both parties and kept clearly before the people that no radical action has either been taken or is contemplated. On the contrary, all that is desired is only what other nations already possess and is in the truest sense conservative and preservative in the highest degree. The ease and rapidity with which the Commission was established, which has already abolished demoralizing rebates and is rapidly giving to corporate investments the security they possess in other lands by bringing them under supervision, is a great triumph for our governmental system in all departments, legislative, executive, and judicial, and gives to all the assurance that no emergency can arise in our country which will not be promptly and successfully met. An intelligent, just, and fair-minded people at the base, cordially approving the salutary measures of their representatives, with the President, a great reforming force at the head, leading the way. End of section 21. 
my experience with railway rates and rebates. End of the Empire of Business by Andrew Carnegie